So, Well, it's 6.30 and I'm going to begin. For those of you who haven't seated yet, uh, there's a couple chairs. Maybe we can shift a little bit and we have a few more chairs coming as well. Like we had talked about last week, uh, we are basically full at capacity in this room. I think they set it for about 100 chairs. So we are completely full. Um, and so, but since we weren't overflowing, we decided last week, as I mentioned, that we're not going to do the Thursday session, so we'll just do Wednesday session. But as you saw last week, and what I'm doing again tonight, if Jay will get out of the way over there, thank you, Jay, we are actually recording it. So I was able to take the sound and the recording and blend them together and make a video, and I'm going to figure out how to post that. We'll probably post it on YouTube, and I'm hoping to get the links of each of the video classes on the classroom page uh, at the Grace Church website. So that way, if you miss a week or a couple people are here tonight that weren't here last week, you can go back and watch the recording. So I got it all set up. I even got the slides kind of in a picture in picture in the upper right hand corner of the video. So I think it's going to work. I just got to figure out where to post them and where to get you guys all the links. So I'm hoping to do that again on the Grace Church website on the classroom page. Uh, By the way, if you haven't registered on that classroom page, please do that because that's the only place that I have to collect your emails just in case we need to communicate for some reason or another. Well, welcome back. It's warming up. I think it's, uh, it's uh, for the next 10 days, we have mid-30s in sight, so I'm really looking forward to that. This cold weather is getting old. I always forget why I continue to live in the state of Minnesota. It's either the great weather or the low taxes. What was great weather... <laughs> Low taxes. What was the reason again? No, actually, it's because all my family is here and all my wife's family is here. And we have a wonderful place called Grace Church where we get to hang out a couple times a week, right? And uh, so I'm thankful for that. Well, let me, uh, other, any other admin stuff? We got more chairs coming. Uh, if you did not pick up a book, pick up a book tonight. Again, those are my gift to you. Uh, but uh, some people wanted me to show, wanted to show me their homework. I don't, I don't need to see your homework. <laughs> so you just uh, got to know there's a uh, 300 question test at the end of this class. So just be ready for that. But I won't look at your homework. No. So uh, let's pray and we'll get going. Father, we do thank you so much for this place, this part of your body called Grace Church. Thank you that we can gather together still in this country to study your word. We don't take that for granted because around the world there are places where people cannot even own a Bible, let alone study it and proclaim you, Lord. Um, as we see in the chapter Acts when uh, Peter and Paul were arrested, they said, uh, we can't help, they were ordered not to speak in your name anymore, and they said, we cannot help but speak about what we've seen and heard. Lord, as we begin to study this plan of yours for the end of the age, uh, we don't want to, we want to be like that, that we can't help but to speak about what we've seen and heard. So as we gain understanding, help us share it with others. Give us boldness. Even Paul says, pray that I might proclaim this fearlessly as I should. So, Lord, equip us and prepare us to be light in this dark world. Now, Lord, we just ask you to lead this study. Be our teacher. Let the power of your word and the power of your spirit lead us and guide us and teach us tonight. We pray all these things in your name, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last week we had kind of an introductory week, and we didn't get through all the slides. I actually had several emails. Remember, my email is in the front of the book, so email me with questions and stuff. And actually, uh, several of the questions were, oh, we're going to get to that, we just didn't get to it last week. So we've, com- we've finished off last week talking about overcomers, and I just think this is such a powerful truth, that the beginning of the book of Revelation in chapter 2 and chapter 3 have these seven letters to seven churches. Each of these seven churches has a promise to them, and we read through those promises last week. Uh, For example, the last one to the church in Laodicea, it says, you will not be hurt by the second death, right? Pretty big promise. But John in Revelation doesn't define that word overcomer there. So we go to 1 John chapter 5 and we see that he, who also wrote, wrote that book as well, defines the word. Who is it that overcomes? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Christ. And why do we overcome? 
John 16, 33, because he has overcome the world. We are in Christ, so therefore we are overcomers. And all those promises in chapter 2 and chapter 3 to him who overcomes are ours if you are born again, if you are a true believer in Christ. Amen? Amen. One of the things that was next that's in your book, you probably saw it uh, this week when you kind of started exploring it for the homework, was this list of all the places in the Bible where Jesus is described. Every book in the Bible. I know you can't read that, but on, in your book, you have this list. And I love to just look at it. I won't read the whole list, but just look at some of the ways that Christ is described throughout Scripture. So no matter where you are in Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, you are studying the person of Christ, either directly or indirectly. So in Genesis, he's the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's our Passover lamb. In Judges, he's our judge. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In Samuel, he's the seed of David. In Chronicles, he's the God of our salvation. In Isaiah, he's the virgin-born Emmanuel, the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. In Ezekiel, he's the fourth man in the furnace. Uh, In Joel, he's the God of the battle and giver of the Spirit. In Malachi, he's the Son of Righteousness. In Matthew, he's the King of the Jews. In John, he's the Word, the Light, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the King of Israel, the Savior of the world, and the Light of the world, the Door, the Good Shepherd, and the Resurrection, and the Life. In Acts, he's the Ascended Lord. In Colossians, he's the firstborn over all creation. And in Ephesians, he's the head of the church. In Hebrew, he's our high priest. In 1 Peter, he's our chief shepherd. In Jude, he's the only wise God, our Savior. And in Revelation, he is the Alpha and the Omega, the Lion of Judah, the slain Lamb, and the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. So wherever you turn in the Bible, whether we're studying end times or beginning times or the Gospels themselves, we are studying about Christ. I love that list. So why study the end times? Really quick, we didn't get to this last week. It's a study of our hope. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's our blessed hope. By the way, what is that glorious appearing in Titus 2? Is that the rapture or the second coming? It's actually the rapture while we await the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who have fallen asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. In fact, just about everywhere this rapture, this end times is described, as when we study the rapture passages in 1 Thessalonians 4, for example, they usually include some kind of uh, message of encouragement or hope for the believer. And it is. Number two, to discern the times. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 6, basically says that while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. So this day is not going to surprise you But are there any signs, are there any prophecies that point to the rapture of the church? And the answer is no. There's no signs for the rapture. It's a signless event. Nothing precedes the rapture that points that the rapture is going to happen. Now, lots of people have tried, and you see up there that in this class there will be no date setting. We won't try to set any dates for the rapture of the end times. Lots of people have tried over the centuries. In fact, I have a whole list uh, that I got off the internet. It's about 20 pages long of people who have tried to set a date for the rapture. Uh, They've all been wrong so far. In fact, one guy wrote a book 
back in 1988. It was 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Would Happen in 1988. And it sold many copies, millions, I think. Uh, and then it didn't happen. The next year, he rewrote it and titled it 89 Reasons Why the Rapture Would Happen in 1989. That one didn't sell quite as good as the first one. But it hasn't stopped a lot of people from Harold Camping to the Y2K movement, people thought the end times was coming, to uh, the four blood moons recently, to the Revelation 12 sign that we looked at that we talked about a bit last week. Um, many people have been trying to set the timing of the end, of the rapture of the church. And he says that the day or the hour is not known, we cannot know, but will it surprise us? First Thessalonians says it won't surprise us because we are children of the light. Why won't it surprise us? Because we know it's coming. Jesus talked about it. Every generation expects it. Yeah. So he's told us that it's coming. He says, I'm coming again. I come as a thief in the night. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll surely come back and take you to be where I am also. Right? That's from John. It's one of the first references, is the first reference of the rapture in the New Testament, in the Bible. So we won't be surprised. But to discern the times, we see the stage being set, don't we? We see things kind of falling in place. In fact, there are theologians, uh, some of them kind of nationally known, that talk about things are not falling apart, they're falling in place when you look at the world. That this plan is, is we see the, the set, we see the characters, we see the things coming in place for this time to come upon the world. We don't know when it's going to happen, but we see it getting prepared, don't we? So a couple examples, just really quick. In Revelation, it talks about a 200 million man army. Well, there were not 200 million people on the planet when John received his vision in in 96 AD, and yet he saw a 200 million man army. Well, as of about 1980, China says that it can field an army of 200 million men. Hmm. In Revelation, it says that these two witnesses are killed by the beast, we'll study them, and their bodies lie in the street for three and a half days, and then the breath of God comes into them, and they are caught up to heaven. They rise up to heaven, and it says the whole world looks on. How can the whole world look on as two people rise up to heaven before satellites and telecommunication and you know, boy, some people will probably be Facebook living it, and people will see it all over the world, right? So that's an easy one today, whereas, you know, 80 years ago or more, that would have been, you know, inconceivable. So there's lots of ways that the stage is being set. One of the big ways was that in May of 1948, Israel became a nation again and has begun to return to their land, haven't they? And so today, right now, and we'll spend two weeks on Israel, today about half of Israel has returned to Israel, okay? And that's a big sign that the stage is being set. But like I said, I think I said last week, it might be tonight, might be next week, might be 10 years from now or 50 years from now. I I don't know. So there's no sign. Number three, did you know that there's a crown of righteousness talked about for all of those who long for his appearing? Uh, 2 Timothy 4.8 says, Now, there are many, there's about five crowns talked about in the New Testament. I actually believe it's one crown. I don't think we're going to receive multiple different crowns. I mean, typically a person only wears one crown as said. I think that one crown is just described in different ways uh, in Scripture. Uh, but it says, for those who long for his appearing, um, if you're a believer in Christ, you will be raptured, and I think you will receive that crown. And then blessing. Turn to the first book of Revelation. And someone read verse 1, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 3. Chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So there's a blessing. If you're going to read the words in this book and heed the words that are written in it, God promises a blessing. And actually, in, on, in Lesson 3, the last page of your homework is an open sheet for you to journal any, any way that you've been blessed 
during this study. When I first took this class, it was a two-year revelation class, and we t- kept a journal of our blessings. And, in, and when we finished the class, we all kind of went through that and talked about it. And it was such a blessing to hear everybody's discussion and, and ways that they had learned and grown in their faith and so on. Um, one of my big blessings that I wrote down right at the end is because we touched so many parts of the Bible in covering the end times, putting that puzzle together from all over Scripture, one of my blessings is I came to realize this is God's Word and I can trust it from beginning to end. All right? That was a big blessing for me. But you write down your blessings on how you are blessed during this study. And then finally, my goal for this class is to know Him. And if you're going to trust somebody with your money, with your finances, with your children, or with anything, you need to trust them. And the more you know them, and as long as they prove faithful, the more you can trust them with that stuff, that value. Well, we are studying the Lord so we can know him more, so we can trust him more and grow in the faith and knowledge of him. A word on prophecy really quick. Second Peter 1 says this, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets through humans spoke from God as though they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So who is the only one who can tell you what's going to happen in the future? Gene Dixon? Some tarot cards? Palm reading? Horoscopes? I'm a, I'm gonna put, how many of you... No, don't raise your hand. How many of you buy horoscopes and go, oh man, that just means fortune cookies. I don't know, there's, look, God knows your future. Amen? He's the only one. And so we, man, doesn't know what's going to happen in an hour or a day, let alone hundreds of years for some of the prophecies that are in Scripture. He knows. Prophecy is unique to the Bible. Some commentators will say fulfilled prophecy are God's fingerprints on this book. No other book has predictive prophecy and its fulfillment, you know, that you can show and look at and prove, if you will, like the Bible. No other religious book in the world. About a third of the Bible is prophetic, and it is like a puzzle, like we talked about. And also, like we talked about last week, leave your preconceptions behind. If you've read commentaries or books or seen shows, just try to say, you know what, I'm going to try to let all the passages that we look at over the next 14 weeks or so unveil God's plan for the end of of the age for me and put some of the other stuff aside. I started a study of the end times on Saturday morning with a small group. Uh, One of the gentlemen couldn't make it to the study, and uh, so their small group, I said, look, let's just do an overview ourselves um, uh, on Saturday mornings, um, and we'll just do a little end times overview. And one of the first things that happens is the guy sitting next to me says, well, I'm a post-trib Uh, rapture guy and there's nothing you can do to convince me (laughs) that it's going to be pre-trib and uh, so I'll let you know what happens in five weeks but and I like I said last week again it's going to be hard so how many of you found the first homework a little difficult to completely understand yeah it it's we got to piece it together tonight and we're going to do this one last word on the end times When I first started studying this, these Left Behind books were out, and a lot of people were interested in the end times. And that seems, in the last 15, 20 years, I've seen that die out in in the church. In fact, right before this, the couple days right before we started this class, I got this in the mail. It's from Israel, My Glory. And it says, Why the Rapture Doctrine is Being Left Behind. And in the article, he says, What happened to the once popular theology of the rapture? Why do so many evangelical Christians reject it today? More and more Christians, evangelical Christians, are kind of setting aside the end times, rejecting the concept of the rapture, of this blessed hope. And so you are going to need to know why you believe what you believe from Scripture. And so we're going to have to look at those passages so you know. There is a place in Scripture where it says that we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed and we'll be caught up to heaven. What is that if it's not the rapture of the church? And we will look at in detail those couple passages. I think one of the reasons is that there are many contemporary pastors, and I'm going to pick on Rick Warren for a second, because he said this, when the 
disciples wanted to talk about prophecy, Jesus quickly switched the conversation to evangelism. This is in one of his books. He wanted them to concentrate on their mission in the world, and he said, in essence, the details of my return are none of your business. What is your business is the mission I have given you. Focus on that. He goes on to say, anyone who lets himself be distracted by studying Bible prophecy from the work I have planned for him is not fit for the kingdom of God. We are fit for the kingdom of God by faith in Christ alone. Right? You will not see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. Period. End of story. That's the biblical truth. He didn't say you can't know the detail, as he says. He says you can't know the date. He gives us massive amounts of detail about the end times in the Bible, and we're just, we're just going to scratch the surface over the next 14 weeks of all the places in the Bible that talk about this plan for the end of the age. So if you're going to ignore all that, well, you're going to have to throw out massive hunks of Scripture from the Psalms and the minor prophets and the major prophets and big, large hunks of the, of the New Testament as well as the entire book of Revelation. So he's not the only pastor to teach this. There's a lot of them in the country. Say that again. He's not the only pastor to teach this. Yeah, I... No, I'm, I don't, I, she, she asked, there's other pastors that teach this as well. Yes, I just put his picture up there because he's the most well-known. This is just a general, there is a general kind of, you know, it, the movement within the evangelical church is we're going to set aside all that end time stuff. It's hard, it's too complicated, it's a distraction, it keeps us from our mission, and so on and so forth. And uh, so I just happen to have a couple of quotes from this guy. But uh, there, yeah, there's, many, there's lots of pastors and many churches and denominations and ministries that don't talk about this at all. Um, how many of you know Jan Markell? She, has a, she actually does her conferences here at Grace Church twice a year. She's got a radio program. Uh, she sends out a, a newsletter that uh, I get. And she talks about this often, that the church is ignoring the end times and she spent much of her adult life in her ministry teaching getting people on her radio program uh talking about god's plan for the end of the age and all the issues surrounding it and she's seen this we've i I actually know her we've talked to her we've talked about this that the church is losing its hope of the rapture and its understanding of the end times ma'am It's, it is, I find that it's a wonderful tool for evangelism to bring in the end times. A lot of, I think I mentioned this last week, a lot of people have an understanding of God and maybe how you get to heaven. Not a lot of people know a bunch about the end times. So you start working some of it, what you know about that, and, and all of a sudden people start going, hmm, hmm, he is coming back again. I wonder if I am ready, you know, and things like that. So. I know Rick. I went to his church. I'm actually good friends with him. Yeah. Yeah, so I've got it. person who would call you on something like that because he, I've seen him bring thousands of people to Christ. So we need to be careful who we're bashing. Yeah, I don't think I. You know them by their fruit. Yeah, I don't think I bashed him. I just. I'm just saying, if you're going to put that up there, let's be fair. So I've have, I have a reference here. I have a reference here. Purpose Driven Life, page 285, is where that quote is. I forgot to put the reference on the next quote, but it's a pretty well-known quote by Rick Warren. I'm not questioning. I'm not questioning his fruit, his belief, his faith. I didn't say anything like that. So, and I and I did. I just I I think. Yeah. I, I have a di- I, I, I will be very open to say I have a disagreement with the these this quote from Rick Warren and what he says. I've never met him. I don't know him, and so he's just a national pastor that I used. But I could have picked a number of other pastors that have said things like this. 
So I really don't think I I am bashing uh, Rick Warren, Pastor Warren, in this at all. So yeah, I just have a disagreement about whether or not it's it's valuable and worthwhile to study prophecy from the Bible. So that's my that's the point that I'm making with this. Okay. Yes, ma'am. We're in one right now, and we're doing it this moment. Uh, you know, I, I don't, does, does anybody know? Because I, uh, I don't know. I don't go to a lot of the church, other churches or know a lot of the other pastors around town. You know, if, if you have anybody else heard of some pastor doing a teaching from the end times from the pulpit or whatever? I don't, yeah, what? Yeah. Revive at Brooklyn Park has. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I've been. I mean, I've been doing this class here for 15 years. So um, yeah, I don't. I, I don't know about other churches in this in the city. Does what? You know, I the the last kind of official study that I remember was when John Egan actually left. He was doing a countdown to the end times, which he had done a couple years earlier. Uh, I know I've heard over the last since he's left twelve years ago references to the second coming and the hope that we have of the rapture and so on. So I don't know that has Troy ever done a study on it? Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think he's done like a whole study on it. But I know it's. I mean, we we believe in a future. Tribulation, and is, you know, I don't, I don't know that that's in our statement of faith. Someone pull up their smartphone and pull up the statement of faith at Grace Church and see if they, anything's in it. Okay, I'm going to get off this slide because it obviously uh, it was a little controversial. We'll, we'll just put that aside. So one of the things that I've decided to do is I've always thought about you getting your nose into the scripture when I do it, but I've realized this is hard. So I'm going to give you a very brief overview of where we're heading this semester in terms of the 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 big picture. Okay? So there you go. There's the end times. This is a chart. It's actually in your book, towards the end of the book. Uh, I think it's lesson 10. Let me look real quick. 11? Yeah, it, at the end of lesson 11 is actually this chart. I put it in there so you'd have it. This is a chart by a guy by the name of Clarence Larkin, who uh, over a hundred years ago was a architect draftsman kind of guy. He had a whole bunch of pencils and he would draft building and engineering drawings and so on. Well, he left his work, became a Christian, became a pastor, started studying the Bible and did nothing but draw what he saw in scripture. And this is his drawing, one of many, a couple hundred drawings that he has in some books that he has. Again, it's Clarence Larkin. And this is his book, uh, this is his drawing on the book of Revelation. And it's fantastic. And I remember the day I found this book. It's called The Greatest Book of Dispensational Truth, I think is the official name of it by Clarence Larkin. And I started reading it and studying his charts. My chart of the end times matches this almost exactly. You see? (laughs) I'm not a draftsman, I'm not an artist. Uh, I'm kind of a PowerPoint kind of guy. So this is my chart. But if you, if when we get done with this class, you're going to know uh, most of the detail. Now, there's only a couple things that I disagree with this on, a couple placement of things. But the big picture is basically this chart. And this chart is also in your book in uh, Lesson 6. So this chart is where we're going to kind of build and work on and, and work off of by lesson six. But I give it here just so you can be familiar with it. Start looking at it to start hopefully creating a framework that we can start putting some of the pieces in. So what are the main pieces? What's, what are some of the border pieces of this puzzle that we're going to fit together? First of all is this rapture. It's declared in Scripture. God says that He's going to, there's a day coming where we are going to be caught up with Him in the clouds, right? 
The rapture is our resurrection day. That will be the day that we receive our glorified bodies, whether you're dead in Christ or those who are alive and remain in Christ. On that day is the day that we'll receive our resurrected glorified bodies. That's the rapture day. So we're going to talk about the who, what, where, why, and the when, the timing, where does this rapture go, and why the Bible declares, I think, where this rapture goes. The rapture happens at any moment. There's no sign for it. One day the trump's going to sound and we're going to be changed and caught up to heaven. Okay? After the rapture, there is a period of seven years generally called the tribulation period. This tribulation period is generally divided into two halves, three and a half years and three and a half years. This is the tribulation period where there are seven seals judgments, there are seven trumpet judgments, and there are seven bowl judgments. Now, one of my disagreements with Clarence Larkin is he has seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, and we're actually going to see, I think that you will see, that the seals are an overview of the all seven years, and then we have trumpets and bowls, but we'll, we'll get to that. During this tribulation period, we also have this guy called the Antichrist, or the Beast. Um, this Antichrist uh, does a lot of things, including this mark of the beast, which is done actually by another beast called the false prophet. So there's actually two beasts. This Antichrist is indwelt by Satan. Uh, so you actually have Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Some people call it the unholy trinity of the end times. Uh, so those are the three main bad characters of the end times. There's a bunch of good characters, and we will look at all those in Lesson 5. We have two witnesses who are preaching the gospel. We have 144,000 who are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, and they preach the gospel. And, uh, th I mean, there's a lot of characters, and we'll look at all the characters of the end times and how they fit with the events. At the end of this seven-year period, we then have the second coming of Christ. So this is the Revelation 19 second coming of Christ back to earth. When he sets his feet on the earth, he begins to reign. And how long does he reign for? A thousand years. And that's declared in scripture that he will reign on earth for a thousand years. After that thousand year reign on earth, there is going to be a great white throne judgment and after the great, that's the judgment of all unbelievers. And after that, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. Heaven and earth are apart today. For all of eternity, they will come together. All right? And that's where we spend all of eternity. So that's kind of the, the outline, if you will, of where we're going to be going over the next handful of weeks. The rapture of the church followed by a seven-year tribulation period, followed by the second coming of Christ to earth. Where does he come to, by the way? Mount the Mount of Olives. Very good. And then he rules on earth for a thousand years. Who rules with him? We do. Ah, cool, huh? And then the new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem at the end, and that will be our, our eternal state. Okay? Um, I just thought I'd read this. So really quick, one slide on each of these. Here's the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, along with 1 Corinthians 15, are the two big rapture passages. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, here's that word of encouragement encourage one another with these words. That's the rapture. The tribulation, uh, we talked about, oh yeah, the harlot, Mystery Babylon, the great harlot is another character. This is a depiction of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. These are the first four seals that come upon um, the, during the tribulation period. And the second half is the Antichrist uh, is indwelt by Satan. Oh, in the midpoint, I forgot to say, the Antichrist sets up an abomination of desolation in the temple of God. Is there a temple standing at the Mount of Olives to, today, right now? No, it hasn't been standing since 70 AD, right? Uh, when the temple was destroyed by the Roman general Titus, actually destroyed the temple. I got a picture of that tonight. Um, and uh, 
but so if there if the antichrist is going to set up an abomination of desolation in the temple what has to be rebuilt the temple is going to have to be rebuilt we'll talk about that the second half the antichrist will be indwelt by satan and he goes after israel in a big way uh, but the second half of the tribulation is basically when god pours out the finality of his wrath on the earth until he comes this is actually a picture from the eu it's a depiction of a woman riding a beast. This language right out of the book of Revelation, the woman will ride the beast, and yet that's uh, outside of the EU building in Brussels. So we have the beast, we have the woman who rides the beast. He sets up an abomination, he makes war against Israel, and the mark of the beast. This is a, a, a famous painting from the 1500s of the Tower of Babel. This is the EU Parliament building on the right. The Antichrist is going to have a kingdom and we are going to study the aspects of that kingdom. But isn't it fascinating that the European Union would pattern their parliament building after the Tower of Babel? Isn't that fascinating? So we will look at where this revived empire of the Antichrist will come out of and rise to worldwide influence and rule. Now he, he gets to rule, Satan finally gets to rule the, the earth, rule the world, Uh, But he's basically ruling over God, pouring out his judgment on the earth. That's what he gets to rule over. Then the second coming. That's a a painting by uh, uh, Pat, I can't remember her last name, Morento, Morento. And uh, it's Christ coming on the earth. If you read Revelation 19, as we will, uh, you, you see that he's, crowned. He's got a sword coming out of his mouth. The armies of heaven are following him. And uh, he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty on the earth. He doesn't come as a little baby the second time. Right? He comes as a conquering king. Pretty fascinating depiction of Christ at the second coming, huh? And then the millennial kingdom after that, for a thousand years, Satan is bound Christ reigns from Jerusalem, we reign with him. The lion will lay down with the lamb, right? Huh? No. You're right. You got to know your scripture, man. It doesn't say that. It says the wolf will live with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them all. Isaiah 11, 6. So isn't that funny? If you Google a lion lays down with the lamb, you find millions of examples. If you, do, if you Google the wolf will lie down with the lamb or whatever, you, you find like two. And, but that's what scripture actually says. And then there will be peace on earth. So we have seen the beauty contestants get their question, what if you were in charge, what was the one thing that you'd wish for the world? And they always say, peace. world peace, right? Peace on earth. Well, guess what? It's not going to happen until the Prince of Peace returns and establishes peace on earth so that men will beat their weapons into plowshares and there will be peace on earth. So when they say that, they're actually, even though they don't know it, saying they are hoping for Christ to return and establish peace. So they probably are Christians then, right? No, probably not. The great white throne judgment, this is the judgment of all unbelievers. Christ and God are on the throne, but we are on the throne as well, judging the world. Do you not, Paul says, do you not know that you will judge the world? And uh, so we will be on one side of that judgment, and all unbelievers throughout time will be on the other side of that judgment. And if anybody's name is not found in the Lamb's Book of Life, they're thrown into the lake of fire after that judgment, and Scripture says that lake of fire is the second death. I have a phrase that I use often, and it's born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. Born once, die twice. If you're born, remember Nicodemus and Jesus, you have to be born again. You need to be born of water and born of the Spirit. So if you're born just once physically, you're going to die physically, and you're going to die at the second death after the great white throne judgment. However, if you are born twice... If you are born again of water and of spirit through faith in Christ, then the second death will have no power over you, so you will die only once. And the second death has no power over you. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die 
once. And then the new heaven and new earth, we only have a chapter on this, but uh, the biggest thing is God will dwell with man. And we'll talk about this. We'll get into these things. And so the, the, the line from the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yes, it will. And when you pray that prayer and say those words, you're talking about God's plan for the end of the age. Hmm? Faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Why? Hmm? Why is love the greatest? Are you going to need faith in eternity? Yeah, right now we walk by faith, not by sight. In eternity, will we still need faith? No. Will we need hope? Pardon me? Who hope? Paul says, who hopes for what he already has? You already have your inheritance. Right? But love. Will we still have love? Yeah. Faith becomes sight. Who hopes for what he already has? But love is the greatest and remains. So yes, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. But I love studying God's plan for the end of the age when we won't need faith and we won't need hope to grow our faith and hope today, right now. Amen? You see that? So we're going to study a time when we don't need any faith and hope to grow our faith and hope right now, today. Cool. All right. That line from that, it is well, Lord, haste the day when faith shall be sight and the sky be rolled up like a scroll. I think one really good barometer of our faith is how do you feel about the rapture coming? Are you ready for it? Can you say yes today, right now? Are you ready for it to come today? If you say yes, your, prob- your faith is probably sitting in a pretty... If you're saying, no, Lord, you know, I'm going to hold off. You know, I want to see my grandkids or, you know, I want to get married or, you know, I got this vacation to the Bahamas all planned out and, you know, after my vacation or, you know, after whatever. And just kind of just use that as a measure of maybe I better check where I'm at. See what I'm saying? I think it's a great barometer of your faith. And we talked about this one already that he's going to prepare a place for you. So this is the time, just as in the days of Noah, Matthew 20, in the days of Noah, Matthew 24 says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage right up into the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what was going to happen until the flood came and took them away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man, at the rapture, at this, at this coming, at this plan for the end of the age. By the way, God then brought them into the door and closed the door. What does John see in Revelation up in heaven? A door. And we go through the door, just like Noah and his family were protected from the wrath being poured out in the world by going through the door. So too John sees it. By the way, who's the door? Christ is the door. Yes, sir. Yeah, no. So his question is, is it the rapture or the second coming? If it says second coming, it's kind of terminology more than anything. Some people call the beginning the rapture. And then when he returns on his white horse, the revelation... And both of those together, some people, some theologians will call the second coming. Most people call him returning to earth at the end of the tribulation, the second coming, and this the rapture. But really, just like his first coming included his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection, so his second coming encompasses the rapture, the tribulation, and Christ's return to earth. See this? See the nomenclature issue there? So it's just how we described it. So I think that's talking about the rapture of the church right there. So, all right, let me change here. So 
So turn to Daniel 9. What happened to my PowerPoint? There we go. So I'm going to start reading in verse 1. Just the first couple of verses, I'll stop you. Daniel 9, verse 1. One more. So I turned to, to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. Good. So then there's a whole big prayer there that we won't read through. But if you didn't, read through that prayer of Daniel. It's a wonderful prayer. So where is Daniel? Where is he? In Babylon. What year is it? The first year of Darius. I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures. What did he understand from the scriptures? About the desolation of Israel, how long it would last, or in Jerusalem. Right. So how long it last? So, sorry? So it's going to last 70 years. So Daniel, so in order to understand the end times, we've got to go back to this character, Daniel. He's sitting in Babylon... And he's reading the book of Jeremiah. And how long do you think they've been in Babylon? So they were in, Daniel was taken captivity from Israel and brought into Babylon, right? And so what timing are, do you think we're at nearing the end of this 70 years? Yeah. Yes. So we're almost done with the 70 years. And Daniel is reading the book of Jeremiah and he takes this passage of Jeremiah figuratively and then just doesn't do anything with it. No. No, he takes it literally. Do you want to hear what he was reading? Let's turn there. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 25. Keep something in Daniel because we'll keep bouncing back to there. But turn to Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 8. And someone start... So I'm going to start in verse 8. How can you say we are wise? For we have the law of the Lord when actually... Wait, wait, wait. Jeremiah 25, 8. Oh, I was in Jeremiah 8. Yep. Did I say Jeremiah 8? No. Sometimes I misspeak, so you need to know what I meant, not what I said sometimes, so... So how long are they going to be in Babylon? Okay, one more verse. What happens after the 70 years are done? Then after the 70 years of captivity are over, I will punish the king of Babylon and his people for their sins, says the Lord. I will make the country of uh, Babylonian a wasteland forever. Okay, so Jeremiah is before uh, Nebuchadnezzar came before Babylon came, before they attacked, and before they carried away a bunch of Israel back to Babylon. And God is telling them, because, did you see that key line? Because you have not listened to my words, this is what's going to happen. Babylon is going to come on you, and you're going to be taken to this land, this faraway land, for 70 years. And when the 70 years is done, I'm going to judge Babylon. We're going to read one more thing that happens. What words... 
What is he talking about that he's not listening to? And it's the word that Charlton Heston, I mean Moses received. On the, nobody did Moses like Charlton Heston, so I, just, I had to include his picture in here. It's the words of the Lord that Moses received. When God gave Moses the law, he said, now if you follow these commands, you will be blessed. But if you don't or disobey these commands, you will be cursed. In fact, turn to Deuteronomy 28. Go all the way back to Deuteronomy. So God has given the law of Moses. Moses is giving this great speech towards the end of Deuteronomy here. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 1. God says this, Now, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all His commands I give you this day, your God will set you high above all the nations on the earth, and this is how you will be blessed. And all the way through verse 14 are some of the blessings that God would give to Israel if they followed his ways. Verse 15 starts the curses. However, if you do not obey all the words I give you this day, here's what's going to happen. Now look at verse 36. One of the curses This is way back in Moses' time, right? Long before Jeremiah, long before Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. One of the curses is the Lord, if you do not obey his words, 36, the Lord will drive you and the king set over you to a nation unknown to your fathers. Who do you suppose that is? Babylon. See that? Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 36. So this, this kind of discussion of blessing and curses is in Deuteronomy 11. It's also in Deuteronomy 28. I just don't have a slide for it. Okay. So all the rest of that chapter are all the curses that will come upon Israel if they don't obey. What actually ended up happening? Yes, all these curses came upon Israel, just as God said they would including being taken to a land far away that your forefathers did not know for 70 years. Go back to Jeremiah because Daniel could have also been over in book 20 I'm sorry in chapter 29 and verse 10. And in chapter in chapter 29 of and verse 10 of Jeremiah it says this. Actually go up and look at verse 4 really quick. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those carried away into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So this passage is written to whom? Israel that has been carried away to Babylon, right? Okay, we drop down. Verse 10. So this is what the Lord says. When the 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. So what happens at the end of the 70 years? Yeah, they'll come back to their home. So Daniel is reading from Jeremiah God's judgment upon Israel that they would be sent away for 70 years and at the end of 70 years, he would bring them back. He understood that, literally, and he begins to pray. Yes, ma'am. What is the time frame between when Jeremiah wrote this and when he actually wrote Jeremiah and the fulfillment? Good question. It's decades. I don't know the exact amount of time between when they were carried away in about 560 A.B.C., Um, I would have to look that up because I can't remember the exact dates off the top of my head. Israel was carried away in three stages and then they came back in three stages. They were there 70 years and Jeremiah was before that. uh, But here they had already been carried away. So the the desolation, that 70 year period had already started by the time uh, chapter 29 comes along. So Jeremiah was, you know, preceding the exodus to Babylon uh, by some amount of time. But I just I, I can't remember exactly what that is. Okay. What's the next verse? But yes, sir. Quick yeah. Um, did, did God make Babylon desolate? Yes, that's a big question. Did God make Babylon desolate? We saw that in the previous reading, right? 
from chapter, what were we in, chapter 25? So in chapter 25, he ends that and says he'll make Babylon desolate. That's important. It's very important because when we go and look at the identity of mystery Babylon in Revelation, one of the options is literal Babylon rises again. Okay? But we're going to see elsewhere in Scripture that God actually says, I've destroyed Babylon and it will never rise again. So when we start talking about the identity of mystery Babylon, we're going to kind of come back to that idea that Babylon was laid waste. Who conquered the Babylonians? Remember? Medes and the Persians. Okay? And they conquered them and Babylon never rose again. Okay? So it's been laid desolate forever. So that's important when we get to the identity of mystery Babylon and who we think that is. Jeremiah 29.10, what's the next verse? What comes after 10? 11. Who knows Jeremiah 29.11? Right? Okay, let me, yeah, you guys, most of you know it. Now, if this is your life verse, you know, listen carefully, please, over the next two minutes. Okay? Who is this passage listened to? I'm sorry, who is this passage spoken to? To Israel, carried away to Babylon, right? He just said, Israel and Babylon, you're gonna, you're, you were brought there as a judgment from God. That judgment is going to be 70 years. But when that 70 years is done, I will bring you, those who are in Babylon, back to Israel. For, the, for I know the plans that I have for you. Israel in captivity in Babylon declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you and plans to give you hope and a future. Who is he referring to there? Israel. Don't worry. I know you're in captivity in Babylon, but I'm going to bring you back to your land because I know the plans that I have for you. Now, Christian, does God know your plans that he has for you and your future and all your days and so on? Yes. But if you're going to use that as your life verse, understand the context first and who is it for. If you then still want to take that principle, which is still true, and use that as your life verse, great. It's a wonderful verse to have as your life verse. Okay? But understand the context of it first. Okay, Make sense? All right. So Daniel begins to pray. Let's go back to Daniel. And again, wonderful plan or prayer. Notice in verse 11, by the way, he says, all, this is Daniel knowing why he's sitting in Babylon. He's praying and he tells us all why he's there. For all Israel has tra- transgressed your law and turned away, refer- refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses... You just read those in Deuteronomy chapter 28, right? So, so Daniel not only studied the book of Jeremiah like we just did, he also was studying the book of Deuteronomy like we just did. And he said, The curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against you. They didn't follow God's ways. So the consequences came upon them. He is a God of restoration. So has he left Israel? No, we, we will study. that There is yet a future for Israel, a future salvation for Israel. As Romans says, all Israel will be saved. And we will understand exactly what that means by the time we're done. Okay? So he begins to pray. And get, who appears? But Gabriel. All right, so Gabriel appears. And just as God sent them, gave them their first judgment of 70 years in Babylon, the angel Gabriel is about to announce to Daniel Israel's second judgment. Are you ready? Okay, this is where the math starts coming in. So if you're a little slow in math, you're going to have to poke your neighbor or something and have them help you out or get your calculators out or whatever. It's not hard, it's just We're not used to talking in these terms, and so it gets a little bit complicated. I promise that we will cover this multiple times, and by about week 
you know, whatever, depending on how slow you are or whatever, <laughs> it will start sinking in and you will start getting this, okay? So don't get frustrated. I know that people get frustrated. So let me read. So Gabriel appears and uh, he says, you know, Daniel, you're a great guy. You've understood this. And so as soon as you begin to pray, pray an answer has been given, which I have come to tell you. Therefore, consider the message and understand this vision. Verse 24. Seventy sevens, and that's in quote. How many of your translations has the word sevens? Seventy sevens. How many of your translations has the word weeks? About half and half. All right? So I'm going to use the word seven or week interchangeably. We're going to look at the Hebrew word there. It's Shabua, And we're going to know that word as well. So it's a period of time. And we'll, we'll look at that. So let's just read through this. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people in your holy city to finish transgressions, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and anoint the Holy One. 25. No one understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one comes. Who's the anointed one? The Christ, the Messiah. There will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. So how many sevens will there be? 69. There will be 69 sevens or 69 weeks. Not literal weeks, by the way. We'll get to that. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. And after the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. And the people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And in the end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end. And the desolation has been decreed. And then we have this next passage. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. Now we have all 77s, right? So this is the 70th one. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offerings, and on the wing in the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end is poured out on him. All right, we're going to break this down and look at each piece. Okay? No, we're going to do it, really. He gave me a look like, good luck. <laughs> Number one. How long is this judgment? Well, it's 70 sevens or 70 weeks, depending on your translation. But like I said, the Hebrew word for that is Shabua. And that word in the Hebrew simply means sevened. Sevened. So it's a seven of something. So a week in English is a day sevened, right? So that's why we call it a, a week. You can call it a Shabua. But a seven, you can also seven a year, and you therefore have a seven-year period, right? In fact, many things in Scripture, in the Jewish culture, would be in seven-year cycles, all right? So like the Sabbath rest for the land was every seventh year. We tend to think in decades, in our Western mind, in the Hebrew mind, they thought in sevens. But some prophecy folks think this is seven weeks, Others think it's a week of years or seven years. We need to figure out which one it is. Generally speaking, if we search all of Scripture for this word, do you think we'll find a place where it's clearly defined for us? And everybody shook their heads. <laughs> yes. You don't have to turn here because I think you're all familiar with the story from Genesis 29. When Jacob was in love with um, Leo, Leah, Rachel, Rachel. But Laban, his wait, who was his father? Laban. Laban gave him the other daughter, the older daughter first. Remember, on their wedding night, he played the old switcheroo. Yeah, I don't, I don't exactly know how that worked, but he wakes up the next morning and realizes that you know he's gotten duped. And so he goes to his father-in-law and says, hey, wait a minute. I was 
marrying the other one. And he says, basically, no, we never give away the younger daughter before we give away the older daughter. And so he says, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter as well, Rachel. And so he says in verse 27, finish this daughter's bridal week. Finish this daughter's bridal Shabuah. Then I will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. So what's a Shabuah? A Shabuah is seven years. We know that from Genesis. Okay, everybody got that? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so the bridal Shabuah was seven years. So a Shabuah is a seven-year period because we know that he needed to work another seven years to get the younger one also, and Laban calls it a Shabuah. If you look at the Hebrew there, that word translated week in English is actually the Hebrew word Shabuah. So what is a Shabuah? A seven-year period. Okay, what's a decade? A ten-year period. What's a Shabuah? A seven-year period. All right, see how easy this is? <laughs> that was like a unconvincing. So Shabu is seven-year period. So Daniel's 70 weeks of judgment is how many total years? Seventy sevens I decree for your people. Seventy-seven-year periods I decree for your people. 490 years I am decreeing for your people. Everybody got that? 70 times 7 is 490 years. So if God says 70 Shabuahs are decreed for your people, and that's a 7-year period, I simply multiply 70 times 7, and I get 490 years. So you can put in your margins in your Bible, 490 years are decreed for your people and your holy, holy city. Who is the judgment for? Number 2. Well, it tells us, for your people, who's Daniel's people? Israel. Israel and your city to do these things. Now, if you don't know anything else about this prophecy as it relates to Israel, what do you think the day is when Israel will finish transgression, put an end to sin, atone, not stone for wickedness, I'm sorry, atone for wickedness, Bring in everlasting righteousness and so on. What do you think is the only day when that is going to happen for Israel? What day? The second coming? Yeah, very good. Yeah, that's going to be the second coming of Christ when he is going to save uh, actually a remnant of Israel on the day that he returns. So we're going to set it there for now and we'll come back to that. I mean, I mean, Christ returning. Second, I generally refer to it as the rapture and the second coming. The rapture at the beginning of the tribulation, the second coming at the end of the tribulation period. Okay, so if I ever say second coming, I mean him coming on a white horse, Revelation 19, sword coming out of his mouth, treading the wine press, so on. So what's the starting point? Verse 25. No one understand this. From the issuing of the decree... To, to rebuild, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So let's map this out. We have a starting point, point A. Until the Messiah comes, point B. Now, if you were a Jew living hundreds of years before Christ and someone said, when you see this point A, and then this period of time, then the Messiah would come. Is that a pretty big deal? Te God is telling us, telling the world, when the Messiah is going to come. Do you see that? And he's going to come after point A. So there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. So I'm just going to simply add seven sevens plus 62 sevens. And I'm going to get to 69 sevens, right? And if I multiply 69 sevens by a seven year Shabua period, I get 483 years. And then the Messiah comes. 
What's your next question? <laughs> When's the second coming? <laughs> what, you're, so you're living before Christ comes. They say from point A, this decree, there'll be 483 years and then the Messiah is going to come. What's your next question? When's the decree? Right? Who wants to know when this decree is so you can figure out when the Messiah is going to come? Anybody? Do you think that decree is in Scripture? Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's take a look. The starting point. So now we're looking at the starting point of Daniel's 70 weeks of judgment upon Israel. He says, from the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Let's look for that decree, shall we? Everybody? Someone said Ezra. That's a very good place to start looking. Because what are the two books of the Bible that describe Israel coming back from Babylon? Ezra and Nehemiah. So let's start there. Turn to Ezra, chapter 1. After Chronicles, before Nehemiah. And I'm going to go to chapter 1. Because this, is a, this first one is commonly thought to be one of the options for the starting point. There's actually five different decrees in Ezra and Nehemiah. We're only going to look at two because all the other decrees don't even come close. Most of them are like, stop working and then do this. And then, so we're going to look at just two of them. So in Ezra chapter 1, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, we actually know what year that is. According to scholars, that's 538 B.C., According, uh, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout the realm and to put it in writing. Does that sound like a decree? Yeah, sounds like a decree to me. What is the decree? Verse 3. Any one of his people among you, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord. Is that the decree we're looking for? What does he say to build? The temple. What was the decree that we're looking for? To restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Is this a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem? What is it a decree to restore and rebuild? The temple. You see the difference? Turn to Nehemiah chapter 2. Let's look at the other candidate. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, now we know what date that is. Isn't it interesting whenever you read the Bible and you see these dates and you just kind of pass over them and there's lots of unimportant information in the Bible and it's like, no, it's all important, as we're going to see. When wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers were buried, what city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. We keep reading and it says, Can the king let him send me to the city of Judah? I'm sorry, verse 5 where my fathers are buried, so that I can rebuild it. Rebuild what? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city. Remember the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Verse 7, if it pleases the king, may I have letters. Is that a decree? That is a decree. The king gives Nehemiah a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Jerusalem. See that? So we have our starting point. And we know when that starting point is. It's 445 B.C. 
Are you ready? All right. Everybody see the difference between the Ezra 1 and the Nehemiah 2? Okay, because there's a difference when those happened. A big difference, and it makes a big difference in our calculation. So we're going back to Daniel chapter 9. Because he says from, the st- from that issuing of that decree, it's actually March 445 B.C., God said there'd be seven sevens and 62 sevens, or 69 sevens. A seven is a seven-year period. A Shabuah is a seven-year period. So 69 Shabuahs is 483 years. Are you ready? Because at the end of that time, the Messiah is going to come. Are you ready to figure this out? So let's take 445 BC. I'm putting a minus sign in front of it because it's a negative number, right? We then add 483 years. And we get 38 AD. Now, because there is no year zero, and when we're dealing with integers, we have a zero integer number, right? When we're doing adding and subtracting normally between positive and negative numbers, there's no year zero, so we need to add one because there's no year zero. And we come to 39 AD. The Messiah comes. No. No. I agree. Something's wrong. We're close. We're close enough. All right, should we just move on? Close enough for government work, right, as they say? All right, you only have to be close with hand grenades, right? And horseshoes and hand grenades, you only have to be close, and then it still counts. No, God's prophecies are never close. They're precise. So what are we missing? Huh? All right. What are we missing? This is the sun and the earth and the moon. In our time, in earth time, a year is 365.24 days. A month is 29 days. 0.53 days, and a day is a day. A day is the earth revolving around its axis once. A month, generally, is a moon revolving around the earth in one complete orbit. A year is the earth going around the sun in one complete orbit. Everybody get that? But God doesn't use that when he speaks prophetically. Everywhere God speaks prophetically in the Old and New Testament in the book of Revelation, he uses 360-day years. Hmm. Okay. Now, I know that's true, and I'll show you that in Daniel, he says a time, times, and half a time. A time, one year, times, two years, half a time, a half a year. That's a a three-and-a-half-year period. Revelation, excuse me, he says the same thing in Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation 11, he says, they, of speaking of half of the tribulation period, the three and a half years, they will prophesy for 1260 days. That's three and a half years. And then in Revelation 11, he says, trampled by the, the city will be trampled for 42 months. Again, that's three and a half years. That's three and a half years if this is true. 1260 days is three and a half years if you have 360 days per year. 360 plus 360 plus 360 plus 180 is 1260 days. 42 months is three and a half years if you got 12, 12, 12, and 6, 42 months. Those two timings are equivalent, so each month must have 30 days and each year must have 360 day years. God speaks this way, so I know that's how he speaks. So we're going to have to take that into account when we do our calculation. Now, I'm going to try to explain to you why I think God speaks this way. Okay, this is my theory. Are you ready? Back in Genesis, at the time of the flood, God uses a couple of phrases, and he describes some days and some months. And he says, from the 17th day of the second month when the deep burst open and the flood began, that the, earth, the waters flooded the earth for 150 days, 
And then at the end of the flood was the 17th day of the seventh month when the ark came to rest. So it's the 17th day of the second month to the 17th day of the seventh month is five months and 150 days. Well, that's only true if there's 30 days per month. So at some point in time, just before the flood, I think there were 30 days per month and 360 days per year. And if you look at it, in Genesis 1, God says that he set these objects in the sky as lights in the expanse of heaven to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. This is how we tell time. Right? I think when God created the earth, the earth revolved around the sun in a perfect 360-day years. And the moon went around the earth in exactly 30 days per year. And that 30 days went by one month, and the earth moved all the way around, and in 360 days it came, and it was one year. And I think that's how God created this place. So what happened? When the flood came, so that's God's time versus our time. His year is 360, ours 365. His months are 30, ours are 29.59. That's the amount of time the moon takes to go around the sun. And it's, the moon doesn't really guide our months as much as it used to, um, if it was right on before. But our day is his day. So if we're going to understand this prophecy, instead of using years, we're just going to simply use days. Make sense? Because his days are our days. They're the same. So really quick, at the flood of Noah, you guys understand that the rain that came at the flood of Noah was not some rainstorm. It wasn't a cloud. It wasn't a thunderstorm. The Bible says that the earth burst forth and all of these fountains of the deep somehow were thrust into the atmosphere, probably supersonic and just filled everything and destroyed everything. This is a map of the, uh, of the mid-Atlantic ridge line. You guys understand that the continents were once together. Um, many scientists say that happened over millions of years. I think it happened quickly, maybe at the flood, when the earth literally burst apart and ripped a seam in the earth and split the continents. It's just like the Grand Canyon. Most scientists believe that, oh, hey, look, look what a little bit of water can do over millions of years. And I think, well, no, look what a lot of water can do in a short period of time, right? And that model fits the Grand Canyon. And, 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 I can't, I, we won't go into it. Who saw Del Tackett's movie, by the way? Um, uh, Genesis is, is history. Is that what, Genesis truth? Genesis is history. A great movie on understanding that the, the Grand Canyon was made from a lot of water in a little bit of time. It's kind of all what the science of looking at the flood. And he looks at Mount St. Helens and this canyon that's carved out over a short period of time after Mount St. Helens. looks exactly like the Grand Canyon done in a very short period of time. So, but won't go into it. The bottom line is, is, you remember the Asian earthquake? Do you know the earth actually moved about a centimeter from that earthquake? Well, what would happen if the entire seam of the earth, like a baseball, was ripped apart at the Great Flood and we have a massive global event like is described in Genesis at the time of Noah? And I think that's the time where the orbit and the rotations were thrown off just a little bit, a few days, and we now are off. Regardless of whether or not that's right or not, we still know that God speaks in those period of times. So look what we need to do. We need to take the starting point, 440, March 445 B.C., and instead of using 483 years, I'm simply going to use days. So I multiply it by 360 days a year, and I come to 173,879 days. Well, now let's map it out. We go from March, they actually know the day, People, uh, historians think it was March 14th, 445 BC, we add on 173,879 days, and we come to April 6th, 32 AD, Nisan the 10th in Hebrew language. Did anything significant happen on that Sunday? Well, it just happens to be the Sunday that Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, and for the first time in public accepts the praises of Israel 
as the king of the Jews. Your Messiah has come to the day that God prophesied to Daniel 500 years earlier. So here's the cupbearer, Nehemiah, receiving this decree in 445, and exactly 173,870 days later, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. Wow is right. How many of you have never heard that prophecy for the first coming of Christ before? Never heard it? About half of you. Yeah, it's one of the most powerful prophecies in all of Scripture. We know some of the first coming prophecies, that he'd be born in Bethlehem, he'd come up out of Egypt, he'd be betrayed by a friend. But God actually gave us another prophecy that said, this is the day to expect your Messiah, your anointed one. Wow, is right. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Sunday, Nisan 10th, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world is presented to Israel. A little aside, on Sunday, Nisan 10th, according to Leviticus and the law of Moses, do you know what else Israel was doing that day? They were selecting their Passover lamb, their spotless year-old lamb without blemish, without spot or blemish, to be crucified that week. I'm sorry, to be sacrificed that week for Passover. And here our Passover lamb is being selected by Israel, if you will, as the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So we've accounted for 69 of of the sevens. 69 of the sevens. Got me? Everybody? You still with me here? 69 of the sevens have been accounted for. How many sevens are left? There's one seven left. One Daniel's 70th seven or 70th week is still left. One seven year period is left. So let's finish the prophecy. What happens next? Uh, The anointed one will come. Then he will be cut off. Verse 26. What do you suppose that is? What is that? It's the crucifixion of Christ. Yeah. So Christ is crucified. On that day or after that day? After. Later that week, right? So later that week, he's crucified. And then it says... The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Do you guys know the history? When was the city and the sanctuary destroyed and by who? Titus. In what year? 70 AD. So in 70 AD, that part of the prophecy will will have been fulfilled. The city will be destroyed. So are we before or after 70 AD? We're after. So we're here now. So after the temple is destroyed, here's a picture of the Roman armies coming and destroying the temple. Um, History says that they uh, set it ablaze. The troops were so upset and angry that the siege had lasted so long and was so deadly that they put it ablaze. And uh, the gold within the temple melted down into the rocks And so the Romans ordered their soldiers to pry the rocks one off of another and throw them off the Temple Mount to get at the gold. And if you go to Israel today, along the uh, foundation walls of the Temple Mount, you'll still see piles of rocks like this that are still there from 2,000 years ago that are from the Temple sitting there. Why is that significant? Because Jesus himself, when he was walking with his disciples, say, see all these things, this Temple? Remember what he said? Not one stone would be left upon another. He was right, wasn't he? We'll look at that when we get to Matthew 24. So the final part of this prophecy we need to look at quick here because it says, He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. Here's our last seven. In the middle of that seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offerings and set up an abomination that causes desolation, and then the end is poured out upon him. Who do you think the him is? 
We have two candidates. It's the Christ is one candidate. The Antichrist is the other candidate. He will confirm a covenant with one seven, and in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and set up an abomination of desolation in the temple of God. Who do you think it is? Yeah, we'll find out. We'll study this. It's the Antichrist, not the Christ. Until the end is poured out upon him. The reason why we started this study in Daniel chapter 9, one is to show you this very cool prophecy for the first coming of Christ, but two, what do we get from Daniel? We get from Daniel that some point in time after 70 AD, there is a future seven-year period that's going to come where this ruler is going to confirm a covenant for seven years, set up an abomination in the temple, and then the end will be poured out upon him. Could that have been fulfilled between the destruction of the temple and today? Why couldn't it have been fulfilled? There's no temple sitting on the temple mount. So we know from this one passage that there is yet a future seven-year period that begins, which we'll study this guy, the Antichrist. He's going to confirm a covenant with many. He's going to set up an abomination in the middle of the week. And at the end of the week, the end is going to be poured out upon him. We've just established, hopefully, you can see it in Scripture for yourself, that there's a future seven-year period coming upon the world that meets that criteria. But that's all we know from Daniel. We need to start filling in all the pieces, don't we? That's what we're going to start to do next week. Father, bless all these people. Help them study their next lesson. Help them grow in faith and knowledge of you. And Lord, we just want to trust you with all of our heart. Lean not on our own understanding, but acknowledge you in all of our ways. And then you will say you make our paths straight. Lord, I pray for straight paths for all these people in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.